This is Ginevra de Benci, who was described by the Venetian ambassador as the most beautiful girl in Florence with her golden hair and dark eyes. It's rumoured they had an affair, but um, I must admit she doesn't look too happy about it. But th this sort of serious look was typical of portraits of the period. And of course, this portrait and most of the ones I'll be showing you today are by Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest painters who's ever lived. Although he had a remarkably small output, there are only 24, and I'll be showing you all 24, that are generally widely or universally accepted works. I won't be including the drawings from his notebooks, and there are also 16 disputed works, which I won't be including. Incidentally, his full name is Leonardo di Ser Piero da Vinci, and Ser Piero da Antonio was his father, who was a notary, a wealthy notary from a family of notaries. And Vinci is a town about um, 20 miles to the uh, west of Florence. He was, Leonardo was illegitimate. It was an affair between his father and Caterina de Mayo uh, Lippi, who was an orphaned 15 year old girl who lived on a nearby farm. He, uh, I'll say more about that later. Uh, and by the way, if you want more detailed information as always, and references, then I have full PDF notes on my website. And if you're watching on YouTube, there's there's a link up here, which if you click on the eye, it will take you to the website, my website with the PDF notes on it. So what did he look like? Well, we know when he was young, he was extremely handsome. He had fine curly hair, which he wore Sorry, someone's just come in with their video on. Um, down to his chest. We also know from what was written at the time that he was kind, generous, left-handed vegetarian who could sing and draw from an early age. And he was so strong, he could bend a horseshoe straight. He wore slightly unusual clothes. He stood out from other Italians. For example, he wore short tunics when the fashion was for long tunics and he wore the colors and, and we've got an inventory of his clothing. So we know he's um, he wore pink, purple and crimson with typical colors. He didn't receive much of an uh, education, but he did he was educated, but he largely taught himself. When he was a teenager, his father, who was impressed by his sketches, showed them to the most famous artist in Florence, Andrea del Verrocchio, who took him on as an apprentice. And this, what we're looking at here, is the only reliable surviving portrait, probably done towards the end of his life, by his pupil, Francesco Melzi. And there isn't any, he has a beard here. There's no evidence of him having a beard when he was younger. And in fact, it would have been unusual on an Italian. Um, Germans tended to wear beards, not Italians. There is another portrait. Uh, it's um, this one from the Royal Collection in Turin, which you might have seen, which was previously thought to be a self-portrait, but now it's not. It's recently been dated into the 1490s. And so uh, Leonardo would have only been in his 40s. And uh, this is a picture of an old man. So it's unlikely to be. Some, some people say uh, he he aged himself to, because he was investigating aging. But uh, I think the simpler explanation is that it's not Leonardo. And this 
is his earliest surviving work done when he was 21. We don't have anything earlier. You can see the date of 1473. And interestingly, it's 1473 up in the top left, written backwards. He was writing backwards even at this early uh, stage of his career. And but perhaps he did it because he's left handed and it's easier to write without smudging the ink if you write from right to left if you're left-handed uh later i think he was um he was pleased with the fact that it was difficult to read it was sort of secret writing what we see here is the arno the river that flows through florence but it's on the boundaries of the city state of florence um at uh, monte lupo the monte lupo castle is on the border of the city state and it's where the arno flows out onto from the hills onto the plain that leads out to Pisa and then out to the sea and it's one of the earliest Italian landscapes it shows Leonardo's interest in landscapes and you'll notice that landscapes often crop up in the background of his paintings he was of course a polymath I'd be talking about his painting but as well as the painting he was um, a sculptor he was interested and studied architecture, science, music, mathematics, engineering, literature, anatomy, geology, astronomy, botany, history, cartography, and the list goes on. He's been called the father of paleontology and architecture, and he's widely considered to be the greatest painter of all time. And he's also credited, of course, with the invention of the parachute, the helicopter, the military tank, and other things. Interestingly, I think he hated violence. He loved animals, which is why he was a vegetarian. He, he regarded humans as the same species as apes and monkeys. His fault is that he found it very difficult to focus on one project for any extended period, and he would often procrastinate. He would find excuses as to why he couldn't complete a project, and it was usually because he'd moved on and was moving on, working on his next project. This is the Annunciation, and it's his earliest major work. He painted it after he'd qualified as a master of the Guild of St. Luke in Florence. And his father, when he qualified, set him up in his own studio, but he continued to cooperate with his master, Verrocchio, for the next five years. And in fact, this painting was previously thought to be by Verrocchio, but it's now widely accepted as Leonardo's earliest painting. In fact, it could have been his first and last painting, as in 1476 when he was 24, he could have been executed for sodomy. He was arrested with several male companions, charged, but was later acquitted as no witnesses came forward. And for the next two years, there's no record of what he did or where he was or where he lived. Also, there's no record, interestingly, of, in his writing or anyone else's, of his sexuality or his feelings for men or women. He, he never married and he did write um, on one occasion in his notebooks, intellectual passions drive out sensuality. Whoso curbs not lustful desires puts himself on a level with the beasts. So it's also been um, claimed that he's asexual. Um, we, we don't know. This painting, dates from about this time, it, and it's now, of course, in the Uffizi. The angels holding a Madonna lily, which is a symbol of Mary's virginity and the city of Florence. And the, the wings, it's thought that he copied from his sketches of a bird in flight. They were lengthened by a later artist. I mentioned, by the way, landscape. Let's look at the landscape in the back of this uh, painting in more detail. I've enlarged it as much as I can. And there's so much detail in this tiny area. There's a city here with 
towers as you'd find in medieval Florence, which had about a hundred towers. There's buildings with um, classical porticos. There's a harbor here with a jetty going out. And there's what over here could be a lighthouse. And it's all surrounded by these hills and mountains. So a sort of typical Leonardo uh, background with a lot of detail, uh, part of his signature style. Uh, by the way, notice I'm going through the paintings as far as I can chronologically. And I say as far as we can because we don't know the dates of um, all of the paintings. This one, Madonna of the Carnation, shows the young Virgin Mary with baby Jesus, and she's holding a carnation, you can see in her hand, and its red colour suggests um, the blood and, and the passion. Again, this painting was originally thought to have been created by his master, Andrea de Ferrocchio, um, but subsequently art historians now generally agree it's by Leonardo, and it might have been produced in Verrocchio's workshop because they were working together at this period and it's possible there was some overpainting by a Flemish artist and again if you look in the background we see uh, mountains and detail uh, more typical of the northern renaissance painting and an aspect of his developing signature style. Incidentally this work is the only work by Leonardo permanently on display in Germany. A famous painting, The Baptism of Christ, now widely accepted to be by Verrocchio, but with some elements by Leonardo, and it's interesting to compare them. Now, according to the artist Giorgio Vasari, who wrote about the lives of the artists some 75 years later, Leonardo's contribution includes the angel on the left. On the left here is the one that Vasari claims is by Leonardo and some of the background and, and the torso of Christ. What we see here is the baptism of Christ by John the Baptist as recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. And Vasari maintains in his lives of the artists that Verrocchio was so impressed by Leonardo's angel that he gave up painting. Now, this may have been an invention. We do know Verrocchio actually painted very few pictures and the last he painted was around about the date of this painting. So Vasari might have been speculating that this was the reason or he might have just um, given up painting at this point. Incidentally, some modern critics attribute much of the landscape background to Leonardo and the figure of Christ. We, we don't really know. Um, one other hint is that you'll notice it's painted in oil and tempera. Most Florentine artists at this time, like Verrocchio, painted in tempera, which is a sort of flatter paint. And Leonardo was one of those who started painting in oils. Florentine pa artists had painted in oils. They used oils to paint durable items like shields uh, that were used outside. And oils were also used by Dutch and Flemish artists and were started at this date to be imported into Italy. And Leonardo was one of the first to use them. And in fact, the, uh, the angel on the left and parts of the background are in oil and the rest is in tempera, which is further evidence perhaps of the parts that were painted by Leonardo. To return to Ginevra di Benci, most modern scholars believe that this is a work by Leonardo and it was revolutionary at the time for a couple of reasons. One contemporary wrote, Leonardo painted Ginevra de Merico Benci with such perfection 
that it seemed to be not a portrait, but Ginevra herself. Also, so it's the accuracy of the portrait, the realism of the portrait, but it's also one of the earliest three quarter views in Italian art. Up to then, portraits in Italy were in profile, um, not so in Netherlandish art, but in Italy. The sitter is generally thought to be the Florentine aristocrat Ginevra de Benci, and it was probably painted to celebrate her marriage or more likely her engagement to Luigi de Bernardo Nicolini when she was 16. He was 32 and a widower, and we know they married in 1474, the earliest date for this painting. But there is another possibility that it was commissioned by the Venetian ambassador I mentioned earlier, Bernardo Bembi, to celebrate her beauty following the conventions at the time of courtly and platonic love affairs between well-mannered gentlemen and ladies. The juniper bush behind a signifies chastity that was the symbolism of juniper and female virtue uh, but cleverly its name in italy ginepro is a play on her name as well now at some stage we know the bottom of the portrait has been sawn off and lost and there's a study now in the royal collection which may be some suggest a preliminary sketch for her arms. In, incidentally, uh, this drawing, which is by Leonardo, is later, as we can see from the dates. And that the hands, by the way, uh, you might wonder why there's three hands, that they're, they're not intended. I, I've just positioned them like this. Um, they're separate, the two hands are separate studies. And they may have been studies, not for this painting, but for a lady with an ermine. A painting we'll see later by Leonardo. In incidentally, uh, this uh, portrait was or is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. It's the only painting by Leonardo on public display in the Americas. This is the Benoit Madonna, widely accepted to be by Leonardo and the first work by him produced independently of Verrocchio. And for centuries, it was thought to have been lost. But what had happened, we now know, is that it had been acquired by a Russian general, and then passed on to his son, who sold it to a fishing merchant, and it remained in that family until the fishing merchant's granddaughter married an architect, Leon Benoit, when it became part of the large Benoit art collection during, this is for the night in the 19th century, which was then sensationally exhibited in 1909. And then this painting spotted and from there, it was purchased by the Imperial Hermitage Museum in 1914. So that's how it ended up in uh, the Hermitage. At the time, incidentally, its attribution was doubted by some and, and the painting was disliked by many. For example, the well-known American art historian Bernard Berenson. He said, I found myself confronted by a young woman with a bald forehead and puffed cheeks, a toothless smile, bleary eyes, and a furrowed throat. Uh, but now it's widely accepted to be by Leonardo. And, and just to accept what explain what that means, I've, I've been using the term, but just to explain universally accepted means unanimous, uh, unanimous, unanimously accepted by modern scholars perhaps with the exception of one or two, but almost unanimously accepted. Widely accepted means it was controversial in the past, but is now 
accepted by a large majority of modern scholars and then generally accepted means it's still controversial but is accepted by most if you like more than half of modern scholars so universally is the strongest then widely and then generally so this is universally accepted to be by leonardo the ad adoration of the magi and it's an unfinished work as you can see it was commissioned by augustinian monks in florence but a year later leonardo still hadn't finished it when he left for milan in 1482 the commission was actually handed on to filipino lippi who um, completed another a, a different painting of the adoration of the magi which is also now in the Uffizi. Now, what's going on here in general, the symbolism represents the pagan world in the background being replaced by the Christian world in the foreground. The ruins you can see in the background on the left may have been the Basilica of Maxentius, in the Roman Forum. And Leonardo may have been referring to what was a medieval legend that the, the Romans claimed the basilica would stand until a virgin gave birth. And this legend claims it fell the night Christ was born. So there, there's the, um, the ruins in the background. Well, it's a nice story, but in fact, the um, Basilica of Maxentius wasn't built until 312 AD. Uh, but by the way, the um, this figure on the far right, some people think is a self-portrait of Leonardo when he was young, uh, but, but we don't know. Scientific analysis of the painting shows that in fact it's only the underdrawing that's by Leonardo um, the conclusion was none of the paint we see on the adoration today was put there by Leonardo incidentally it's thought it's speculated really that the monks who commissioned it rejected the work as too sensational too different not what they're expecting are in an adoration of the magi and they kept it in a storehouse and um rather than destroy it and much later when leonardo's work became valuable someone then painted it over as you can see to make it more saleable another work which is universally accepted to be leonardo saint jerome in the wilderness unfinished What's going on? St. Jerome is holding a rock in his right hand and beating his chest in penance. Bottom right is a lion, his loyal companion, after he had removed a thorn from its paw. It stayed with him. And St. Jerome, you might know best as the person who first translated the Bible into Latin, the, the version known as the Vulgate. Notice the representation of the muscles in his shoulders and neck. Um, at this time, Leonardo was dissecting um, cadavers and studying anatomy. You might be shocked, incidentally, to hear that at some stage the panel was cut up into pieces. And there's a, a story that Cardinal Fesch the uncle of Napoleon, discovered one of the pieces being sold as a box lid and then five years later found another piece and searched for the remaining pieces and eventually assembled the whole panel except for one small triangle which was lost and then his um, descendants sold it to Pope Pius IX which is how it ended up in the Vatican Museums. Virgin of the Rocks, this, um, th there are two versions of Virgin of the Rocks, one in the National Gallery in London and one in the Louvre in Paris. 
This is the version in the Louvre. And this version is generally considered to be the earlier, which is why I'm showing it first, and is universally accepted to be by Leonardo. He painted it when he went to Milan, 1483. And the way that came about is, it, you may be surprised that he was um, known to be a talented musician in Florence and often played to Lorenzo de Medici. Um, he created, Leonardo created a silver lyre shaped as a horse's head. And Lorenzo was so pleased, he sent Leonardo with it to Milan as a gift for the ruler of Milan, Ludovico Sforza. And Leonardo, it, it, it's, um, it's thought that Leonardo um, was keen to go to Milan and stay in Milan. In fact, he stayed in Milan for the next 17 years. And before he went, he wrote a letter to Sforza explaining how he was skilled, not just as a musician, but in creating engineering wonders and, and in painting. And by engineering wonders, he meant weapons of war, which was an important skill at this time. It was in Milan that he created the Last Supper that we'll see later. And it was in Milan that he created um, a huge equestrian monument to Sforza. It would have been the largest Renaissance equestrian statue, but the, the bronze that was going to be used to make cannons uh, was taken from Leonardo and used to make cannons to defend against the invading French. Uh, this was later. Uh, and um, in fact, in 1499, the, the French overthrew Sforza and Leonardo fled. And the, the army... The French army used the clay model for target practice and it was destroyed. But coming back to Virgin of the Rocks, this is the um, London version on the left. Generally accepted as post dating the version in the Louvre on the right. It's interesting to compare them. The incidentally just to explain why there were two because it's very unusual for an artist to produce two versions uh, it's thought that um he was we know he commissioned to paint uh the virgin with infant saint john the baptist adoring the christ child accompanied by an angel usually called the virgin of the rocks um but it seems that the version he was commissioned to produce he sold privately to somebody else. And so he had to paint another version, the later version, to fulfill the commission. So how did the later version end up in England? Well, it was commissioned by the Chapel of the Co-Fraternity of the Immaculate Conception in a church in Milan. And it was sold by the church much later, probably in 1781, when it was bought by an English aristocrat, Gavin Hamilton, who took it back to England and then he sold it. It passed through various collections and was eventually bought by the National Gallery in 1880. So that's how it ended up there. Just to point out some of the differences, it's interesting to compare them. In the Louvre version, as you can see, the angel is pointing at Christ, uh, sorry, at St. John the Baptist and her hand, the hand of the, uh, I said her, his or her, because it's an angel, uh, hand is holding Christ, stopping him falling down the abyss. The um, faces in the older version are more delicate and subtly blurred by sfumato which i'll explain in a moment interestingly the flowers in the louvre version are botanically correct but in the london version they aren't they're fanciful creations 
And also in the London version, as you can see, the forms are better defined and there's a greater contrast. Uh, the, incidentally, the, the cruciform held by John the Baptist and the halos were added later. And, and also, I should add that the yellow cast of the Lou version is discoloured varnish. And the London version, which was recently restored, had a yellow cast over it before the restoration started in 2010. I mentioned sfumato. Leonardo was one of the, in fact, the inventor of the technique and one of the most famous practitioners of this technique, which he he described it as in the manner of smoke. And in fact, sfumato literally means turn to smoke. It's a blending of the edges of the forms to avoid any distinct lines or borders. Typically, Leonardo used it in the face, and I'll give some other examples later. This is Madonna Lita and shows Mary breastfeeding. In Christ's left hand, let me enlarge it, there's a goldfinch, which is um, a common symbol of the future passion because the goldfinch and the robin represent the passion as they have spots of red on the plumage and it's said that Christ's blood splashed onto them as the robin pulled one of the thorns from his head. The name Lita comes from the Milanese family that owned the painting for much of the 19th century until it was sold to Tsar Alexander II, which is how it en ended up in the Hermitage. In the Louvre, there's a drawing we know is by Leonardo, which I don't know what you think, but is possibly a sketch for this painting. It's disputed, but um, it, it looks as though it might be. The painting, incidentally, is widely accepted to be by Leonardo, but some think it isn't. Um, Professor Martin Kemp, who's a Leonardo expert, claims it's by Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio. Boltraffio was one of the two strongest artists to come out of Leonardo's studio. Incidentally, when it was loaned to the National Gallery, it was exhibited by the National Gallery as an autograph work by Leonardo, that is, solely by Leonardo. Sorry, I've just got to stop a video. Somebody came on with their video still on. I apologise for that. Um, where was I? It's exhibited as an autograph work by Leonardo, that is, it's solely by Leonardo, but... Um, Kemp, Professor Kemp, claims the curators didn't think it was by him, and he says that it was labelled as solely by Leonardo, presumably a condition of the loan. This painting is unfinished. It was produced while he was in Milan, and it's his only known male portrait, and it's widely accepted that Leonardo painted the figure's face. Some scholars suggest the body to be the work of Boltraffio. Some say Giovanni Ambrogio de Predis, who was a famous painter in the court of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan. Until the 20th century, it was actually thought to be Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, a portrait of him. But when it was restored in 1904, it was discovered he was holding, as you can see, a sheet of music. So it's now thought to be and is described as portrait of a musician. And we don't know which musician. There were a number of famous musicians in the court in Milan at the time. And there's various names been put forward. 
but we can't. There's no evidence to decide between them. The Milan court was very conservative, which we think is one of the reasons uh, Leonardo stayed there. And but but being conservative, they would have expected a portrait to be in profile. And so Leonardo has unusually chosen this three quarters view. And ju just to put a date on it, three quarters views became common among Nederlandish painters after about 1420. You can't be precise about these things, but sometime before. But they didn't become common or popular in Italy until about 1500, when they fairly rapidly became very popular, full face and three quarter views, and the profile views went out of fashion about 1500. Some other artists, incidentally, if you look at Sandro Botticelli, he painted three quarter views and full face portraits um, from about 1480 onwards. And it was about this time, just to fill in the personal history of Leonardo, it was about this time that he went on a diplomatic mission to Hungary on behalf of the Duke of Milan. And that led to a number of engineering and other projects in Hungary. He was only there about a year. This is Cecilia Gallerani. Uh, she's actually a native of Siena, um, but was a favourite of uh, Sforza, the Duke of Milan. Again, a three quarters view. And unusually for the time, Although she's not, she's looking away, there's a certain intensity of her in her gaze, something that was absent from a lot of the depictions of women in early Renaissance art. And Leonardo, we've actually got an insight into Leonardo's thinking because he did write a, in his notes, later published as a book, um, about his thoughts on painting. He wrote, the first intention of the painter is to make a flat surface, display a body as if modelled and separated from this plane. And he who surpasses others in this skill deserves most praise. This accomplishment, with which the science of painting is crowned, arises from light and shade, or we may say chiaroscuro which means light and shade. So you can see from that quote that um, Leonardo's aim here is for the body, the person, the portrait to, to, to stand out separately from the background as if modeled in three dimensions. We know less about the symbolic meaning, although we do know that the ermine at the time symbolized purity and and leonardo in fact wrote the ermine would rather let itself be captured by hunters than take refuge in a dirty lair in order not to stain its purity um not true of course but it was a common belief at the time but also the duke sforza had recently been awarded the order of the ermine by the king of naples so that is another reason why Leonardo might have included the ermine. And in fact, scientific examination has shown the ermine was added later in the second or third stage of the painting. Notice the expression has changed from the solemn expression we saw in Ginevra de Benci to this enigmatic smile, which is achieved by the use of sfumato at the corners of the mouth and, at the, in fact, at the corners of the eyes, the, the two areas of the face that a smile is signalled. And by using sfumato, he's made the, um, the smile 
enigmatic. We're not we're not completely sure whether it's a smile or not. This is La Belle Ferronniere, and it's generally accepted to be by Leonardo, but it's um, subject to debate. And it's not as widely accepted as some of his other portraits, like Portrait of a Musician, even, or Lady with an Ermine. It was called Ferronniere which means Iron Monger's daughter, as a joking reference to the reputed mistress of Francis I of France, because the husband of the mistress's name was Le Ferron. Later, however, the sitter for this portrait was identified as Lucretia Crivelli, who was a lady-in-waiting to Sforza's wife, Beatrice d'Este, who was, uh, Lucretia Crivelli was also married and she became the king's mistress. But, but that attribution has more recently also been challenged. So there are various arguments about who it might be. There's a drawing, possibly a copy of a Leonardo drawing. In other words, it's not by Leonardo, but it might be one of those who was working closely with Leonardo who copied a drawing by Leonardo, which is said to be of uh, Beatrice d'Este, the um, wife of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan. So some people think there's sufficient similarity. I don't know what you think, um, for this to be a preliminary sketch for the painting, subject to a lot of argument. But let's move on to a very famous painting, one of his most famous, unfortunately, seriously damaged. Perhaps his, um, I was going to say best known, but although perhaps his second best known work after the Mona Lisa, The Last Supper. It's um, to be found in the convent of Santa Maria della Grazia, and it represents the moment during the Last Supper when Jesus has just told the 12 apostles that one of them will betray him. It was commissioned by Ludovico Sforza as part of the renovation of the church and its buildings. And it, unfortunately, it's a technical failure on the part of Leonardo. He used a novel technique which didn't work. Normally, if you're painting on a plaster wall, what you do is you put on a section, a small section of plaster, and you paint onto that wet plaster the day you put it on. It dries that night, and then the next day you put on another section of plaster and paint into that. And what happens is the pigments soak into the plaster and become embedded in the plaster, and it lasts virtually forever. Um, we, we have uh, frescoes like this that have lasted since Roman times. However, using that method, you can't change what you've done. And that did, didn't suit Leonardo's style. He was always changing things. So what he did is he sealed the wall with gesso, pitch, and mastic. And then he painted in oils and tempera on top of that. Unfortunately, the damp of the wall came through the sealant and the paint started to flake away fairly early on in the life of the painting. It's been restored, uh, renovated many times. Incidentally, Jesus originally had feet, but a door was knocked through the wall in 1652. But luckily, there was a copy made of the original 
let me show you the copy here it was made by gm pietrino and it was the main source of information for the 20 year restoration of the original you can see it includes um in the original incidentally the um unfortunately the the copy had the top of the copy was sawn off and the sides were sawn off at some stage um but still enough remains for it to be extremely useful as the a source of information you can see there's a floral motif in the tapestries in the side walls of the room you can see glass decanters on the table you can see the features of the figures and there's a lot more information that comes out from the copy now Jesus has just said one of them will betray him and Leonardo is expressing their reaction there are four groups of three apostles the first group I'll, I'll go through it fairly quickly the first group on the left show surprise Bartholomew James and Andrew the second group is important because it shows the one that will betray Jesus Judas Iscariot in in I was going to say you could say in the middle or in the on the left that the, the one with the intentionally ugly face um in shadow who's holding a bag in his hand a money bag in his hand um and um spilling the salt you might just be able to see which was symbolic at the time of betraying one's master and he's showing or attempting to show surprise peter on his left is leaning across him showing anger holding a knife in his right hand which is pointing backwards and he's pointing with his left hand at john the youngest apostle and then there's jesus and then the third group on the right uh, of jesus as we look at it is thomas who's upset james the greater looking stunned and philip asking for an explanation of what's going on then in the final group on the right is matthew and jude thaddeus turning towards simon the zealot to try and find if he's got an answer and he's holding out his hands in a gesture which seems to say don't ask me right the, the painting has um been subject to much speculation usually centered on hidden messages or meanings in the painting uh, one of those um, ideas is in a novel called the da vinci code you might have read by dan brown published in 2003 it's of course a work of fiction but in the book he, he um, nicely um, examines the um the figure of um uh, john here the youngest uh, of the apostles and suggests or says in the in the book that it's actually mary magdalene disguised as or in the place of the apostle john it's um it's a bit clearer to see the um I think it's just um, a painting in the in the style of um, of that Leonardo used for young men. And so let's go back to the the fire the, the the actual painting in the refractory where we can see the the side walls and the ceiling and the table. In another. Um, part of Milan there's a less well-known work in Castello Sforzesco its walls and ceiling are decorated with intertwining intertwining plants um, and fruits and and trees and and down the bottom you can't really see it here but down the bottom there's there's roots and rocks painted in monochrome the name is a puzzle 
Sala uh, della assai means, uh, well, the word assai means plank in Italian. And some believe it was the name of the room before Leonardo started. It was just the Sala della assai. Others believe it was a misunderstanding that we know we have the letter that the Chancellor wrote to the Duke of Milan, who was anxious to know when the room would be finished, and his Chancellor wrote to him saying that the planks used as scaffolding have now been removed. Uh, uh, the, the literal translation is the large chamber is free from planks, or as he says in the latter in Italian, assai. And so it became known because of that letter as the Sala della Asse. The most recent theory is that during this period, the room was panelled with planks to make it less cold. And a re in the recent restoration, as you can see here, I'm showing you here, what they've done is they've installed planks around the room. Whether that's accurate or not, we don't know. And in fact, a number of restorations have taken place. The first one was early in the 20th century, resulted in very bright colours that critics, some critics didn't like. And there was a second restoration in the 1950s, which toned down the colours. And then a third restoration started in 2012 and still continues today. And the point of that restoration is more to stop the deterioration and stabilise the surface. We've reached 1500. And this is the year um, after the French army overthrew Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, and, and Leonardo, and in fact the Duke, fled Milan. Leonardo fled for Venice and worked in Venice on military defences against naval attack. And um, that same year, he continued on from Venice to Florence. And in Florence, a monastery provided him with a workshop. And in that workshop, he created this cartoon of the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and John, St. John the Baptist, a work that at the time one such admiration that it was described, and I quote, men and women, young and old, flocked to see it as if they were attending a great festival. It was that uh, well known and uh, that revered. It's universally accepted by Leonardo and it's in the National Gallery in London. It's also incidentally known as the Burlington House cartoon it's described as a cartoon because it's large and looks as though it was intended to be a cartoon. But if it was a cartoon and used to produce a painting, it would have pinpricks all over it. You, the idea was that you, you put pinpricks along the, the contours and then you dab um, uh, soot all over it from a bag. And then that puts little dots onto the canvas or wall or panel, and then you use that as a guideline for the painting. And there are no pinpricks. So we we know that it wasn't, there's no known painting by Leonardo based on this cartoon. It was painted about 1499 to 1500, or around a bit later, 1506 to 1508, and, and I've put the range of dates in here, but it was probably either the earlier dates or the later dates. And the majority of scholars prefer the later date. Um, the National Gallery and others prefer the former date, so you'll see the earlier date in the National Gallery. The head of Mary is particularly fine, I think. She's looking at Christ, her face is in the same position as the Christ child and opposed to Saint Anne and John the Baptist, who look in the same direction with Saint Anne looking at her daughter adoringly. And you can see here how Leonardo has gained in this drawing use fumato at the corners of her mouth to create this enigmatic smile. 
it was almost lost to the nation in 1962. It was put up for sale for 800,000 from the Burlington collection. And a quarter of a million people saw it in four months and money was raised from donations and the National Art Fund and it was purchased for the United Kingdom. Um, it, in my view, uh, uh, one of the greatest works of art in the country. I urge you, if you haven't done so, to sit in front of it for uh, 10 minutes. Something starts to change. In 1987, it was attacked by a mentally deranged man with a shotgun. It was covered in glass, luckily, but the glass shattered. None of the shotgun pellets went through, but the the glass um, tore the paper and the restorers spent years gluing hundreds of tiny shreds of paper back onto the drawing. It's it's It was this area here, which luckily you can't see if you go and look at it. It, it doesn't distract. And although the painting wasn't used as a basis of a painting by Leonardo, it was interestingly used as the basis of a painting by Bernardino Luini, a pupil of Leonardo. And you can see it's a bit different from the cartoon in that he's included Joseph on the far right, and, and there are other differences but, but largely similar to the cartoon. Then for about a year, Leonardo traveled around Italy with his patron, Cesare Borgia, acting as a military architect and engineer. And on the journey around Italy, he stopped in Mantua. And there he drew this portrait of Isabella d'Este, who was the Marchioness of Mantua. She commissioned a portrait, a painting from him. Um, we we don't know if he ever finished it. We do know from letters, she was a great letter writer, that there is some evidence in the letters that he completed the portrait. Uh, there's a version found in Switzerland in 2015. The painting's been dated to some time. It's, it's a long range of dates, sometime between 1450 and 1650. But most scholars, many or most scholars, dismiss any attribution to Leonardo. So most don't think this is by Leonardo. Letters suggest, as I said, that she, she certainly wanted her portrait painted by Leonardo, and she pushed Leonardo into producing it. But there is one letter that says, sorry, um, I'm otherwise occupied on mathematical pursuits. So he maybe he uh, ne never started it, just produced the sketch and went on to other things typical of Leonardo. Incidentally, Lynn Isabella d'Este was one of the leading women of the Italian Renaissance, a major cultural and political figure, a patron of the arts, leader of fashion. She was described at the time as supreme amongst women and the first lady of the world. And she even acted as regent of Mantua when her husband was away, when her son was in minority. She received a fine classical education. She re wrote many letters throughout her life, which we still have. And so her life story her family and friends are extremely well documented. But I don't think that's a portrait of her, unfortunately, but I think that is a, a drawing of her. Another aside, um, short story. In 1503, Leonardo returned to Florence, rejoined the Guild of St. Luke, uh, walked on a, worked on a portrait of Lisa de Giocondo the model for the Mona Lisa, which he continued working on for the rest of his life. And in 1504, he was invited to join a committee to decide where Michelangelo's statue of David should be placed. It was then that a legendary encounter took place at this location, the um, 
Palazzo Spini is still there. This is it. It was when it was first built in, I think it was 12, the 1290s, the second largest palace, palace in Florence. And um, what happened was Leonardo was walking past. There were a group of people sitting outside on benches discussing Dante Alighieri, his poetry, and they asked him a question about the poetry. And at the same time, Michelangelo came, Michelangelo came by and Leonardo, who knew Michelangelo, loved the poetry of uh, Dante, suggested that Michelangelo answer the question. Now, Michelangelo took offence. Michelangelo was um, afraid that Leonardo was setting a trap for him into saying something stupid. So he, he got angry and said, explain it yourself. You who designed a horse to be cast in bronze, which you could not cast and shamefully gave up. And on saying this, Michelangelo left and Leonardo remained, his face turning red with anger. It said, remember at this time in Italy, or in fact, maybe in parts of Italy, even today, this was no minor matter. It was an, an insult, was a matter of honour, which was life or death. It meant a life or death vendetta. And the two of them tried to stay apart. But the same year, Leonardo had been commissioned to paint the Battle of Anghiari in the council chamber of the Palazzo Vecchio, Florence's town hall depicting a battle between Florence and Milan some time before. And Michelangelo was then commissioned to paint the Battle of Cascina in the same room. Now, both of these paintings have been lost. In fact, they were, they were destroyed when the room was um, uh, refurbished. But we have copies of both, which I'm showing you here, the Leonardo um, was copied by Rubens and the Michelangelo by Bastiano da San Gallo. And that's what I'm showing you here. Very different styles, uh, but I can't imagine what the tension was like in that room as they were battling to in, 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 in paint to uh, prove themselves the better painter. The this is a work by Leonardo that was documented as we we know from um, a letter that he was working on a painting in which Christ is holding a yarn winder. A yarn winder or niddy noddy is used to help wind a skein of yarn a, around the two bars, and um, it's also, of course, like um, a crucifix. And so it's a clever device that is a symbol of Mary's domesticity, but it also foreshadows the cross on which Christ was crucified. And the two main candidates, there are a number of candidates, but the two main ones for this um, Madonna of the Yarn Winder are the Bucklew Madonna, which I'm showing on the right, and the Lansdowne Madonna on the left. It's um. Scientific analysis has shown that the underdrawings in both are by Leonardo. So he was involved in both, it seems, and they're generally accepted to be by Leonardo and another artist. So what that suggests, it, I mean, it sounds a bit strange that he painted two paintings. He did the underdrawing did some of the painting and it was finished by another artist. That's just a suggestion. Incidentally, the letter was from the head of the Carmelites in Florence to Isabella d'Este in Milan, telling her that Leonardo was working on a painting in which Christ was holding a yarn winder, probably commissioned by King Louis the Twelfth for the French court. 
it's and incidentally i i've selected these two but there's nearly 40 versions made by pupils and followers of leonardo this is virgin and child with saint anne and is universally accepted to be by leonardo and what we see is the virgin mary trying to restrain christ as he grapples with a sacrificial lamb symbolizing his passion we believe it was commissioned by king louis the 12th of france but never delivered it's um complex composition the way mary is sitting on her mother's lap is not traditional pose although we did see it in the cartoon uh with in a slightly different position it's not clear what leonardo leonardo was trying to symbolize maybe just a close connection between mother and daughter and mother and son freud had a sigmund freud had a very strange explanation um he thought mary's garment the blue garment had the shape of a vulture turned sideways and this related to a childhood incident which is described by leonardo and i quote translated from what leonardo wrote it seems that i was always destined to be so deeply concerned with vultures for i recall as one of my very earliest memories that while i was in a, my cradle a vulture came down to me and opened my mouth with its tail and struck me many times with its tail against my lips now freud interprets this as a sign of what he calls his passive homosexuality others have described it as an early memory of being breastfed however the word vulture was a, actually a mistranslation of the italian which is more correctly translated as the word kite a different looking bird which seems to undermine freud's theory it's remotely possible that something similar did uh, similar to what leonardo describes did actually happen as kites are raptors that scavenge from human beings and often swoop down to steal food so it's possible a kite did swoop down to near the baby leonardo i um, but but this i'm getting into deep speculation here uh, incidentally freud's interpretation of why he shows two women of uncertain age and similar age is that leonardo's blood mother raised him before he was quotes adopted by the wife of his father ser piero and so in a way leonardo had two mothers at one stage looking after him and christ is being shown as having the same family arrangement as leonardo that's uh freud's interpretation a controversial work though now generally accepted but not universally accepted Perth purchased in 2005 and restored it's gaining acceptance as by leonardo pentimenti that is changes to the composition are found using x-rays in the thumb of christ's right hand which always suggests it's not a copy indicates it's original um the restoration has been criticized for repainting large parts of the picture but nevertheless it set a new record in 2017 it was sold for the highest price for a painting ever 450 million dollars when auctioned by christie's incidentally i pointed out the other day the forger robert Dreesen said in an interview it's absolutely not da vinci as a former art forger he said he can spot a faker miles away and he added have you seen the before restoration and after restoration it's totally different painting now it's unbelievable how people can fall for that end quote well that's his opinion i guess experts are divided one of the world's leading expert who i mentioned before professor martin kemp announced it was genuine 
Now, we know there's at least 30 copies and variations of the painting executed by Leonardo's pupils and followers. And that suggests the fact there were so many paintings of this um, by different people that there was an original by Leonardo from which they were making copies. So there's, a, there's, there's I don't know about evidence, but the suggestion that there was a strong suggestion that there was an original by Leonardo, but which of them is the one by Leonardo? We don't really know. Some people say it's partly by Leonardo. Some say it's totally by Leonardo. For example, the British art historian Charles Hope dismisses any attribution to Leonardo entirely. We don't know. This is a small panel painting generally attributed to Leonardo, or some people think a pupil. We don't know the subject. Some people think it's possibly a sketch for an uncompleted painting, or as I'm showing you here, um, a study for the head of the Virgin from the London version of the Virgin of the Rocks, which I've um, shown here and enlarged here and put it alongside. There's similarities. One widely accepted theory is it's commissioned by Isabella d'Este, and it may be a painting of the Madonna for her private study, which wasn't finished. Because in a letter to her son, she mentions that she gave such a work, um, a uh, picture of the Madonna, to her son uh, on his marriage. And it stayed in the Gonzaga family. And it was described as a painting depicting the head uh, in fact, not of the Madonna, but of a dishevelled woman, La Scapigliata, um, by Leonardo da Vinci, which is lady with dishevelled hair, um, which is the way it's now described. A painting that is so often talked about that it probably needs a talk on its own to cover it, but I'll, I'll try and keep it short. It's now been definitively identified as Lisa Giacondo. Sometimes uh, it's called Lisa del Gerardini. Gerardini was her maiden name. Giacondo was her, uh, her married name. Her husband was Francesco del Giacondo, a rich silk merchant who we know asked Leonardo to paint her portrait. But he never finished it. He never gave it to them. He kept it with him and... Um, finished it, or some say he didn't finish it when he went to France. His use for Marto on the mouth and eyes, as I've been discussing, which has led to this cleverly ambiguous expression, is she smiling or isn't she? It's been widely considered a masterpiece since he painted it, but it achieved worldwide and lasting fame only after it was stolen in 1911, it was returned two years later and the whole world breathed a sigh of relief. Police suspected it was stolen. One of the accused was the poet Guillaume Apollinaire and together with Pablo Picasso, because in fact they had been involved in buying stolen art from the Louvre, but not the Mona Lisa. Uh, they weren't actually charged with that offence of receiving stolen art. The thief was Vincenzo Perugia, who was an Italian petty criminal who managed to get a job working as a handyman in the Louvre and basically just walked out with it. And in, the, and in fact, the guards never noticed it was gone. It was a visitor to the Louvre that noticed that there was a blank space on the wall. Uh, the visitor noticed it because he was in the middle of painting a copy of it. Um, it was two years later that Perugia tried to sell it in Florence to an art dealer, but the dealer called the police. Uh, the painting was returned to the Louvre and the thief claimed he wanted to restore the painting to Italy. And so briefly he became an Italian national hero. Um some people say the painting, there's lots that could be said about the painting. Uh, some say it's unfinished. 
because some people believe that Leonardo became partly paralyzed from a stroke in 1517 before he could finish it. And one of the pieces of evidence they claim is that the eyebrows are not finished. But in fact, recent examination shows she did have eyebrows, but the pigment has faded over the years. The, incidentally, there's many very good copies. This is a copy of the Mona Lisa that's on display in the Prado in Madrid. But let me finish with this painting, the last painting he painted of St. John the Baptist. Widely attributed to Leonardo, still controversial in the past, but most modern scholars believe it was painted by Leonardo. And scientific evidence has um, furthered this attribution that it was by Leonardo. He's normally, it's very unusual painting of St. John the Baptist. Normally, as you know, he's shown wearing a camel hair coat because he lived in the desert on honey and locusts. Here, the figure's haunting beauty, I think, comes from the, the ambiguity. And th this is the peak of Leonardo's sfumato. It's so ambiguous that the sexual identity of the figure is, is in question. The, it's an androgynous face, in other words, with a, with a Mona Lisa type smile. This gesture we've seen before of the upward pointing finger as I think Leonardo uses as a sign of salvation through baptism or, or maybe referring to the coming of Christ. And Leonardo's return, received just enough retain just enough illumination on the body to distinguish it from the background and the body therefore stands out from the background but merges into the background but without disappearing so leonardo died in 1519 at the clos um, chateau in France. He'd gone to France for the last three years of his life. He probably suffered a stroke and he wrote just before he died that he had offended against God and men by failing to practice his art as he should have done. In other words, he thought he should have spent more time in his art and less on his inventions and uh, notebooks. It's said that the king of France held him in his arms as he died. That brings me to the end of today's talk. Thank you again for your time and attention. In future, I'll be recording the talks for YouTube rather than giving them to, as today, to a Zoom audience. And I'll aim, I think, to give shorter talks. And I'd like to finally thank my loyal class for staying with me from our lecture room to Zoom and hopefully in future onto YouTube. Thank you.